Hi, welcome back to the Point Miles and Points Report. My name is Tommy Danielson. I am here reporting from my house in uh, Northern California. It's been a while. Rudy, Maxa, and myself have been on the road for the last three weeks. He's actually still on the road, uh, and he is sleeping right now, uh, hopefully, in Athens, Greece, where he has been uh, for the last few days, and he is coming back, uh, Rudy's coming back to the U.S. Uh, this coming weekend. So lots of traveling going on, lots of interesting things going on, and that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, for those who are not, uh, are tuning in for the first time, this show brings up some interesting things that uh, I and uh, others in the uh, travel miles and points world find interesting, which, you know, can be many, many things uh, uh, right now. And, you know, travel has changed a lot. So uh, we're obviously going to talk a little bit about things that have, um, uh, that have uh, kind of changed uh, travel wise after three weeks in Europe, Rudy and I have uh, both uh, had some experiences there with various airports. Uh, many uh, of the folks watching has probably uh, travel plans to Europe. Rudy and I have a, a tour company called Maxa Tours and that company has uh, done its first uh, tour and is now enrolling the second tour. And we have lots of tours coming up this fall. And you know, we're going to talk a little bit about how that went and also what to look out for, what not to do if you're traveling to Europe on your own. And today, in a couple of minutes, we're going to have Marshall Jackson uh, dial in with us again. Marshall is an avid uh, writer and former American Airlines pilot. Uh, that has been uh, a part of the show for a long time. We're also going to be joined later by Charlie, Charles Hagedorn, who is a frequent flyer and a travel expert based out of Seattle. And uh, those are the guests for today. Uh, and Rudy will be uh, coming back again to us next week. So uh, let's talk a little bit about first about traveling in Europe at this time and, and what the experiences that we have. So there are some airports in Europe that are worse than other. I think that uh, the U.S. has been doing a much better job um, staffing people. Uh, you know, these airports in the U.S., uh, you know, the TSA is staffed by the government, and uh, many of the European airports are staffed by, um, by private companies that are working for the airports that are government-owned. And uh, we're going to bring in Marsh uh, Marshall uh, to chat a little bit before we get into that. How you doing there, Pilgrim? Not too shabby. How about you? Yes. I uh, got home after three weeks on the road with a, a thing for laundry and, and confiscated contraband that uh, security took on the way back. And uh, Oh, my. And, uh, yeah, they took my uh, Norwegian liver paste, those sons of bitches. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's less than three ounces. Uh, you anyway, can't carry uh, food like substances anymore, you know. It's, there uh, you go. There you go. There you go. Well, uh, we're, we we're talking a little bit about how airports are structured here in the U.S. That's it's the TSA uh, that mostly is responsible for security in the U.S. and the in Europe, it's mostly private company that works for right. um, the governments that own the airport airports around town. And I saw some, uh, like you know, like, like there has been a lot of. Um, of uh, of chat about that, uh, virt you know, about Amsterdam and London first and foremost. Sure. And but we've kind of you've traveled a little bit in the last few weeks. There hasn't have. been that many lines and hasn't been any issues for frequent flyers. Not not really. Uh, domestically, uh, security lines for me at least were pretty tame, even in Atlanta. But uh, on a Friday, right? But, uh, it was uh, it was okay. It's been okay from that regard. Right. TCA is always usually pretty good, and uh, it's been good enough. Yeah, and and that uh, actually changed uh, for me. I, I actually i i nor I went to check in the night before because I know that SAS has been having some shenanigans with. You know, I've been using these. Uh, you still have to test to go back into the U.S. I've been using this uh, this EMED test thing. All right. Uh, that you test and you got a dude on the line and he will, you know, record you. So you actually see that you're doing the testing on yourself. Yep. You get the results within 15 minutes and you're good to go. And there's been some. So I went and checked in the night before because I've heard that SAS sometimes don't take those. Yep. And it wasn't an issue. And the dude said, you better be here tomorrow, three hours before. 
And I said, I have fast track. And he was like, well, be here two hours before. And I was there two <laughs> hours before. And I've never been to the airport two hours before. And I walked out. I don't know if you've been to Stockholm, the airport there. Long time, but I have been. So between Terminal 4 and 5, that's where the hotel is, the, Ra the Radisson Blue uh, Terminal. It's inside the terminal. You don't have to walk outside. I walk outside, and there's probably about three-quarters of a mile to where Fast Track is, and this is what met me outside the door, in the, at front of the hotel. So the terminal, you can see where the Finn airplane is there in the background. Yep. And uh, thankfully, that wasn't the uh, that was the the the, uh, the the line for regular security. Uh, I got to the to so so here's this is where where it all started, right? So this is the fast track going back a little bit to where you say the five is, and it yeah. turns around and it comes back again. So um, yeah, it was uh, it was it was mayhem in there, and it was pretty bad to any sense of form getting through through all of the stuff. And literally, the two hours before with fast track and business class, the dude uh, just literally that's the guy in front of me. Also, uh, he, that he's he's he shows like I felt uh, that morning. It's like literally <laughs> I was the last person to board because I was the one in worse shape. And uh, yeah, two hours it took me. I barely made it. And it would have been a major inconvenience. And I know that Rudy flew out of Amsterdam the day before or a few days before that. On the 1st of June, he flew back. Yeah. And he was there like bright and early. I think it was like four hours before or something like that. It took him two. He was first in line to check in and first right. in line to go through security. So I guess you never know. And that's the thing. you got to keep an eye on this thing and follow no local news. But on the radars, the three airports that I would say is uh, Stockholm, Amsterdam, and London Heathrow. Those are three that you need to watch out for and you need to check sure. in advance if you're going to travel to Europe. It's absolutely mayhem. Even if uh, Rudy was lucky, I know that he flew through there going back to Athens this week or, you know, this, this weekend. And yeah. it was obviously he didn't have to go through security then, but it was a three hour wait that day. So I guess that that's the, the story about that. I, I hope that's over by the time I get there in October. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a staffing thing and, and, uh, yeah. and uh, you know, it's, it's, it, Let's not kid ourselves here. All of these things is not staffing because they can't find people. It's because they want to try and and wait as long as po humanly possible before they incur the cost of, of uh, of doing that. So that that's the yeah. truth of things. And you don't have to say it because I already did. All right. Yeah. So let's uh, let's go back into. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, about North Atlantic. So North Atlantic is has gotten their approval. And they're going yeah. to start flying uh, this week, or actually in five days from now. So on Monday, they're going to start flying from Oslo to JFK. It's their first flight. Uh, as you can see, these are 787s. They have nines and they have uh, eights, uh, mostly nines, ex-Norwegian planes, some of the same owners. And, uh, and, um, and that's uh, that's kind of uh, what what the story is with the planes, the same seats, the same layout and everything like that. Uh, and they have, I believe, 12 or 14 or something like that. So they announced Oslo. They announced uh, Oslo to JFK. And then a couple of weeks later, it goes to Fort Lauderdale. Uh, just in time for the best time to go to Florida. <laughs> and then uh, and then they are doing L.A. from uh, early August. And then they announced that they were opening London Gatwick to L.A. and New York, I believe. And now this week, just a couple of days ago, they announced that they were going to do Berlin to JFK and to L.A. And that kind of surprised me a little bit. Seems like a great way to lose money to me. But, you know, we'll see. Yeah, I, what surprises me is that we had a conversation about this and Norwegian uh, long haul uh, you know, Norwegian, the airline was a solid company that made a ton of cash and had always done well. They started up in 2003 with four rented 737s. Mm -hmm. um, they um, put in the biggest 737, 800 orders uh, since Southwest uh, and, you know, American put in theirs. 
uh, the biggest international one and, and were large Boeing customers and they did really well. And then they decided to buy, you know, 38 with two exclamation marks behind it. <laughs> Air, uh, uh, Boeing 787s, wide body planes to start across the Atlantic. And uh, it didn't go well. A lot of unprofitable routes and a lot of planes, one or two uh, stashed away, uh, based in Barcelona, in Amsterdam, in Vienna, in Rome, all over the place they had airplanes, part sure. and stuff like that. And for those who know, I know a little bit, but I don't know how to run an airline, but I know how to do math. And I also know how to do, uh, how to think a little bit about this stuff. And one of the errors that I think they made, and I think, hopefully, would you agree with me when I say that, that they, they were in too many markets and the routes are very seasonal? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and I don't know if that was the right airplane to start the, the, all the international stuff either, but uh, I get, yeah, I I think get the, the idea. Is, but... uh, they wanted to have a high wa volume, but yeah. it kind of didn't work out that way. And I think that, you know, when you start up a market uh, – and you're seasonal that you're stopping to fly in the times when it's quiet. It's, it, it takes marketing dollars to start it back up again. Absolutely. And, and what we're seeing how when the new owners and, or the, not the, some of them owners are the same, but the new management and some of the same owners and some of the investors, I was, they said that we were going to go after the profitable markets and Norwegian, they weren't in the Berlin market. And now you have a handful of planes and you are in three markets already. Oh my <laughs> goodness. In Europe. So it seems like, uh, I mean, I, after that, it sounded like London is a good thing. It was profitable. Also the same thing. Stick with that. And that sounded like a good plan to me and yeah. maybe open more routes from there. But I guess that wasn't the plan, was it? I guess they're trying to burn money. Uh, so we'll see what happens. All, All the right, best. Let's either. bring in uh, Charlie also so we can get a little. Hey, Charlie, hi, what? Hey. Uh, your wife is not making you shave anymore? <laughs> no, not, not, not recently. <laughs> For those who don't know Charlie, uh, he is a uh, lawyer up in Seattle. He's also a uh, Miles and Points expert, a travel expert uh, mm -hmm. who has an opinion about, uh, and is mostly right about mm -hmm. everything he's talking about. Oh, <laughs> mostly. I have an opinion. And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and we, we bring him on the show every once in a while. So you've flown uh, Norwegian. We've flown them together uh, a couple yeah. of times. And uh, what's your take on this thing by having so few planes and now opening up another base in Europe? I mean, I wish it were Seattle, I guess is what I would say. Um, you know, and, and I wish them all the best. I don't know with the fares that they're, you know, the pricing – that they're going to actually be able to make money. Um, it's just so much lower than everyone else. Um, but I would love to be able to fly them while they're still around, I guess is how I would put it. Um, you know, the yeah, Norwegian... I mean, they got, they got a fi fairly decent uh, amount of cash on yeah. hand. And they're starting next week. Monday is the startup date. Yeah. Uh, but I think that they said, uh, you know, they had 38 uh, or they had 35 delivered, 38 787s on order, which is... In, massive number it's yeah. like big as uh, you know as as a comparison uh sas had 12 long haul planes and finner yeah. has 15 yeah. so you know that's uh i think 15 is the number with finner they got some some transition going on with the 350 but mm -hmm. you know uh, now they you know that's the same amount where norse were going to start of, of and they said they were going to start up from their most profitable airports which is oslo and london which they have and now berlin is uh berlin has all of a sudden hopped into the mix yeah um, i mean it, it, berlin's not even a city i usually think of flying direct to like if you said where are you going from the us to germany it's almost always going to be frankfurt i think of frankfurt i think of munich I guess I, I don't know why I don't think of Berlin, but it just. There was an airline that used to fly into Berlin. Yeah. And they don't exist anymore. I, that, 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 that necessarily doesn't mean anything, but yeah. I just, I'm a little, uh, you know, to be honest with you, I'm rooting for this guy. I oh, uh, yeah. these guys. I, sure. I love uh, Bjorn Schuss, uh, who started Norwegian. He was a brilliant guy. He was a little bit, um, uh, he, he made a couple of moves uh, in the latter part that I don't really agree with um, and got, you know, he just literally bit over way 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 too much than he could chew and now seems to me like the berlin move is a little bit premature but you know i guess we'll just have to see 
I mean, if, if I could fly to Europe $600 each way in their premium economy, um, I'd probably do that every single time. I mean, it's just, it's a really comfortable seat. Um, it's easy to sleep in, which is really what I care about. Right. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it was great. All right. So let's move on to um, the, uh, what we wanted to talk about now uh is to uh, a little bit about the uh american airlines they have started given given us a new um fare class uh mm-hmm. and it's called business plus uh-huh. and it's going to be available they're going to try it on on some routes uh to begin with right um and uh they are it's literally business class with um with flagship uh, check-in and security and flagship, uh, dining. And that's pretty much it, right? Is there anything else? I think that you, then it's just business class service on the plane. Didn't, did, did it say that there was going to be a separate cabin or is it just, no, it's not a separate no, cabin. Separate they are class. adding yeah. just uh, first class services. So they're adting the security, they're adding yeah. the check-in and they're adding uh, the flagship, the flagship dining, which is, you know, you have the flagship lounge where you get in if you have one world level. Right. Yeah. And, but at the end of the day, uh, that's pretty much what you get. Um, and you, and it's, it's still the business class cabin. So it's literally, yeah. uh, you know, ch- for flagship check-in and, and, and it's, uh, and it's, uh, and this, the, the first thing I'm thinking about is like, Hey, this is how they're going to retire first class. Yeah. I mean, Maybe. I mean, they have a very limited fleet. They have the 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 321s that go between LA, San Francisco, and some mm-hmm. other secondary markets the, the, in JFK. And then they have how many triple seven three hundred ERs do they have? Eighteen. I, I would say fifteen or twenty. I can't remember the exact number, but that's those are the only wide bodies with with first class. Right. And not really that much of a uh, of an exciting seat. I mean, uh, Melinda and I always have fun with it because we have a little yeah. lot of champagne, and then you have the you can swivel. You know, it swivels back and forth like sure. an office chair. So we sit there, you know, drunk, <laughs> and we have fun in the swivel seat. That's uh, that's what we call it. And besides that, I think the catering is pretty much the same. They add some soup and a little bit better champagne, but that's pretty much it, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It seems like, uh, you know, it's $500 more in the price uh, example that we saw here. I don't know if this is the, yeah. So uh, it looks like they're, they, you know, they have the, 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 it's called business and, mm-hmm. and flagship business and flagship business plus. And for $500 more, you get to check in with the first class gang, which right. you kind of don't because you kind of go through clear or you go through TSA pre-check. And then you have a sit down meal. So that means that's $500 to sit down and have dinner in the flagship dining instead of the flagship lounge. Anybody think that that's worth it? Not me. No. Are those, those, is that one way or are those round trip? Not sure. It looks like one way to me, yeah. but hard to say. It didn't say it's like courtesy of American airlines. So we can't yeah. see what that was, but yeah, you know. I mean, I don't know. I, 400 bucks. I, you can buy a real nice meal outside of uh, outside the airport for four hundred bucks. Um, yeah, I do think you get actually, real bags. We, we don't know I, if that's going to be the case, but I mean, at the end of the day, I think there is a there is obviously an audience for this. But yeah, you know, looking at oh my goodness, who has a motorcycle outside the house? Sorry about that. That's what I get for doing this outside. Yeah, there you go. No, but I think that Finnair has started a, a similar gig, but they have done like an unbundling. So you don't get your seats, mm-hmm. you don't get lounge, and you don't get X amount. And then you can get like a saver business of some kind that's yeah. been pretty popular. But you right. get the seat, which is kind of, you know, who eats the business class meals that much anyway. I mean, it depends. But yeah. No, we'll see what happens. Uh, it'll come out. It says that they're going to start it now for some – some uh, limited markets for Wednesdays through uh, whatever it says in this. Uh, some market will sh- pop up in some markets first to try it out yeah. first uh, yeah. and see if people will will uh, will uh, will dive into it or not. So 
Um, I think, uh, yeah. So I think that that's uh, the, the the story there. We're just going to have to wait and see. Uh, we talked about this a few months ago, back in January, uh, that the fourth and Rudy and I talked about it last week. Actually, uh, early last week, we talked about this because um, because uh, Four Seasons, uh, the Danielli in, in in Venice was looking to leave. Um, Marriott. They've been with Starwood for many, many years, and uh, you know it's an iconic property. And you know Ed, uh, our friend Ed Pizzarello, had his honeymoon there. It's a, a gorgeous place, a little bit on the older side, but you know, as you can see from this picture, uh, having breakfast there is kind of a unique thing, and also having uh, having dinner sure. on the balcony there is also awesome. They said in January they were going to leave, and then there was some information uh, said by loyalty lobby that turned out to be completely incorrect uh, because, you know, that was talked about a couple of weeks ago. They wrote about this in March, and I don't read loyalty lobby that much, but it was uh, what was said in an article there that they were staying. They did. The Italians didn't want to uh, have foreign owners of the property, so mm -hmm. they were going to have it locally owned and franchised by Marriott. But, you know, the press release came out on the 6th a couple of days ago. They are leaving. They are re, uh, the, they're transitioning it to a, a Four Seasons, and it's going to be opened uh, there for in 2025 is when it's going to be reintroduced as a Four Seasons. Oh, so wow. a big loss for Marriott uh, for those. Have any of you guys stay there in uh, in Venice? Nope. Not at that hotel, no. Where'd you stay, Marshall? Uh, Jesus, uh, the, the, the one across the canal, the, uh, the Hilton. I can't remember the, the name. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I didn't know about that one. Uh, yeah. No, I think that this is, uh, you know, but the the redemption. I mean, it's it's the same thing. We saw that happen in Athens too, right? The Astor Palace in the West End, which was the Megadoo host back in 2017 when we had our thing with Aegean, whole big peninsula. I would venture into saying almost 100 acres outside of Athens, gorgeous wow. resort. Um, and they closed it down. They shut it down for two years and they opened it up right <laughs> before the pandemic. And the prices have more than quadrupled. I mean, you can't get a room there for less than a thousand euros now. So oh. it's, uh, it, it used to be off season that you could get it um, for decent money, but they just have. Um, uh, so I, I assume that that will be the same case here that it's going to, the rates are going to increase to a thousand plus. The Daniele, you can easily get off seasons for, you know, three, yeah. 400 euros a night. Even lower than that, if you use a AAA rate of, or or book with uh, with um, with FHR or any of those guys, so less redemption stuff. Or is that something we're going to see in the future? Uh, less uh, less desirable properties leaving uh, portfolios. You mean? Oh, you mean having less of these? Yeah, I get, we've seen now time. two major prop or more major properties uh, disappear out of uh, out of the, and we also saw the Park Hyatt in Hamburg. Uh, leaving Hyatt at the end of this year. Uh, is this a trend or what do we think is happening here? I don't know. I mean, we, we've seen Hyatt add a lot of the these smaller, you know, Joy V and, and some other hotel chains and independent hotels recently that seem, I mean, they're not like super nice, all of them, but they're, you know, a little more boutique-y. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know about, about this it, it's not a great trend though you know the few we've seen that have left uh recently yeah um i think that um you know hotels come and go out of, with out of, of chains and all that kind of stuff but i think that marriott i think has seen the worst of the worst and it's uh they've lost a lot of hotels during the pandemic for many reasons and mm -hmm. uh you know uh, the i would say the only reason to be a marriott customer these days is uh, you know a loyal marriott customers and give them a ton of money is because you have the desirable properties and now we don't know what next year holds when they end when they change their program uh, to being a hundred percent, to be a hundred hundred percent revenue based. Um, yeah, that we'll, 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 I guess we'll just have to wait and see. I mean, maybe that maybe that is more attractive to the hotel owners. I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. we will have to see.
All right. So let's move on to the best champagne in first class. American Airlines. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I couldn't care less about how lucky, uh, how lucky uh, <laughs> defining the best champagne, to be honest with you. But at the end of the day, um, he made a really nice write up of who serves what. And, uh, you know, how important is champagne when you book uh, a, a, an, air, an airplane ride? How much do we think uh, it's worth for people? I mean, for me, it's it's practically zero. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I want I want not terrible champagne, but like the type of champagne doesn't move the needle, you know, really at all. I mean, maybe a tiny bit like. Right. But I but, like champagne. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, it, it, it would never factor in the who or what I book. I don't. Right. Know. I mean, he, he's he's rating uh, he, he's rating uh, them based on the price, and you know, Japan Airlines have uh, have are still on top, and they have been on top, you know, because they have Salon, and Salon is arguably. I mean, if you. I remember one time back in like 2011 or 12 or something like that, uh, where I was uh, tweeting. I wasn't doing the Twitter. I don't do the Twittering with that much, but uh, I was communicating with Brian Kelly on social media somewhere. And he was, I, I was like three days behind him flying to Japan in first class. And he was like, I hope they don't have that so long shit that they have, uh, that they have uh, Dom instead. Uh, and they only had one bottle of Dom, but they had like many bottles of Salon. And I, I hadn't tasted it before. I heard about it, but I hadn't tasted it before. And I was like, I didn't have a sip of that Dom. It was mm. phenomenal. And they still have it. And it's hard to get. Uh, they now have a, a 2007. And they got Cristal also, which, you know, also is kind of a weird champagne. It's it's kind of like a wrapper thing more than anything else. It's not really a, a good champagne to, to begin with. But, you know, two, uh, 350 bucks a bottle. Uh, you have Qatar Airways. They got the 2004 Krug. Uh, I, I have a very loose relationship with Krug. I, I don't I think that it's like better than average. And a vintage and better than average. And Gary Leff, he sent me one for my birthday a few years back. I had it like three or four years ago. It was phenomenal. I don't know. I think it was like 98 or something. And now they mm. serve in 2004. And Singapore, they've known for having both crew, mm. the non-vintage one, and the Dom, uh, from uh, Dom, which is obviously vintage. Uh, and they've had that. And they've had um, uh, Comme de Champagne from Tatinger as well. So... Um, and then Lufthansa has uh, the Cuvée Alexandra Brut. Uh, I've had that a few times. Not really. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think the uh, the uh, the uh, and then uh, Emirates has been dumb the whole way. Always. Mm. That's kind of their dig. Um, uh, ANA is Krug. I don't remember. And Cathay Pacific, also known for that. They also had the. Uh, Comme de Champagne from Tutting Share. Uh, the was that was before. I thought they had that. Well, you, I mean, um, don't you do you remember Char Charlie? The last time you took uh, Cathay, I think it was uh, Tutting Share uh, vintage. The, uh, am I yeah, right? Yeah, uh, I'm trying to remember. It was a red eye, and uh, I got on and ate dinner and went to bed. Um, well, I, I probably had three glasses of champagne and then fell asleep. There you go. Good to yeah. sleep on that. And uh, and Air France actually has that one still. It varies what they have. Uh, they Yeah, he says that. Air France regularly rotates its champagne selection. Yeah. Laurent Perrier and Grand Cycle is, is uh, the one that um, BA has always had. They've had it for years, both in their lounge and on board. Uh, Swiss is pouring it now. And that's pretty much the stuff for there. And then if we move to the lounges, uh, Le Grand Dame uh, in Qatar still, they used to have uh, Bilicot, Salmon, uh, Rosé. They used to have uh, Krug there and some other stuff. I guess that's gone. Uh, mm. The uh, same uh, Veuve Clicquot Grand Dame in Paris at the La Première Lounge. Anybody, you guys been there? I, I've not. I, I haven't. I've contemplated doing the work to get into that lounge uh, and fly that first class, but I have not done it yet. Yeah, I jumped on a fare that was very low. That's how I got in there a, a couple of times. So I, I had the Algeria 
originating one, but they canceled it. So. Uh, okay. Yeah, there you go. I thought they put you everybody in coach, didn't they? Yeah, basically. <laughs> right. And then uh, Singapore Airlines in uh, has the private room, has the – they used to have Dom in the private room before. But, you know, personally, I think that the Tatin Jericom, the Pinot Champagne is uh, equally good. And, you know, American Airlines in their flagship dining, they are serving better stuff in their lounge and they're serving on board, of course, mm. which makes absolutely no sense. But I guess it's cheaper, right? Um, yeah. And uh, moving on to business class. Um, and so Qatar Airways. Wow. I mean, I cannot believe that they're serving better rosé. They must have gotten a, their hands on a... Um, they must have gotten a hands on a uh, of a selection. Why would they serve a much much better rosé than a standard champagne? That's weird. Yeah. Uh, and it's I you know the the LP standard LP is not thirty dollars. I mean that that maybe two years ago, but not anymore. It's a little bit more, but it's a solid. It's a house champagne. It's, it's the in the Danielson household. That's the house champagne here. Um, Eva Air uh, serves the Grand Dame, which is pretty decent. Uh, Singapore Airlines, not sure what that's about. Uh, and that, you know, he's mentioning, uh, what, what he's, the other stuff is just junk. I mean, regular Vaucleco and, uh, De La Mont Blanc, uh, is, uh, Blanc de Blanc is really not that good, but I noticed that I flew SAS earlier this week. They, with all the problems that they have, they have changed their gig, uh, their game up. They were serving Charles Heitzig which is a brilliant non-vintage champagne. And I had uh, a nice bottle and a half of that on my way back with uh, some, uh, uh, some heated, uh, some heated uh, nuts there from, uh, from, from, the, uh, from the forest. And uh, yeah, that was a good gig. Mm. Um, Nicely done. Yeah, I was surprised about that. And I actually, I flew SAS during the pandemic. It was very cut back and they had like a, the bread that they serve was like you could probably, if you threw it at somebody that would probably be set. It would have been an attempted murder. Uh, <laughs> and it was just, the food was awful. It was mm. just, it was, I, I, I brought, I will tell you, I did, br I did bring, uh, <laughs> excuse me. I don't have the COVID already tested, but, um, uh, the uh, I did bring my own food through off the whole champ whole whole, whole uh, traveling long haul and also in, on, in the U.S. It's just dreadful stuff. But the meal that I had coming back was absolutely superb. They had full service. They had um, you know the, the cheeses, the desserts, fresh and stuff. The crew was on point. The new business class cabin on the three hundred and fifty. Yeah. Yeah, it's gorgeous stuff. So. So, yeah, so they're missing that on the list. Uh, I put it in the comments. Maybe it'll put it up. But I think that that's, uh, that should be in the top five. It's definitely better than the two last ones here, um, for sure, that he mentioned as business class champagne. So there is that. Let's – and another thing I want to use. So, Charlie, you uh, – Nexus, about talking about customer service and crossing borders and stuff. Uh, what yeah. did you experience? You Nexus, tell us about what that is for those who don't know. Yeah, so Nexus is, it's mainly marketed towards um, people that live near the U.S.-Canadian border, and it allows for, um, you know, going through in special tr uh, ground lanes. So you get your, uh, there's a Nexus lane to drive across the border in both directions. Um, it's very similar is application and um, process as global entry. You end up getting pre-check and global entry with it. For kids, it's free, um, and so they get global entry and pre-check along with it for free. Um, but it it's really post-pandemic. It's really catered more towards people right at the border. Like there used to be, so you have to go for an interview. There used to be an interview location in Seattle at the uh, at Boeing Field, just south of Seattle. That's closed, and so the pretty much all the interview locations are within. A few tens of miles or right at the border um i applied in january 2020 for an expiration of february or for april 2020 and wow. yeah and my wife was approved in like a week or two something very quickly it took them till december of 2020 to approve me um, Crazy. yeah or for a renewal by the way for a renewal and then, um, 
you know, when the border was closed, there were no interviews. And so December of 2022, so we're now like 23 months after I applied, um, I was finally able to get an appointment and then they closed the border again and they canceled all the appointments. <laughs> and, and then in February of this year, they're like, okay, we're going to reopen for appointments again. And I find, you know, it took me a few weeks. I finally managed to get an April something appointment and granted they've been ex extending Nexus, but only for two years. And so my Nexus expired at the end of it was going to expire at the end of April, but I had an appointment within like a few days. So whatever, no big deal. Um, then they closed, then they decided they weren't going to take any chances. They canceled all these appointments. And then like a month and a half later, they were like, oh, just kidding. We're opening up again, but we're not honoring any of the appointments we canceled, even though we're going to be open. So wow. join the Hunger Games and try and get an appointment again. And I tried for a long time. I mean, I wasn't like checking every hour, but I was checking on a regular basis and there were never any appointments open for Blaine Washington. And I posted in, in the group um, after, you know, searching a bunch for like, how in the world can I find an appointment without, you know, paying someone millions of dollars? <laughs> um, anyway, turns out for $29, you can pay someone, um, they have a service uh, that a lot that will like automatically check for appointments. Um, I don't know what okay. they're doing because the only way I can check if an appointment is to like log into my account and then, you know, do the search, but somehow right. they're able to do it without needing to log in. And then they text you appointments and within 24 hours of paying my $29, I had an appointment for me on Tuesday and my wife had hers today. So we both drove separately four hours round trip <laughs> to get That's our appointment. Cool. Um, and but they, I mean, I would my Nexus was reactivated before I got home. So you know, within just a few hours of getting my interview, uh, it got reactivated. Uh, so I, I should be good set now, but uh, man, you know, I even called Blaine and I was like, "Are you guys actually have appointments or?" <laughs> <laughs> or what? And they're like, oh no, we have appointments all day, every day. I was wow. like, I, I never see any. He's like, you know, I don't know. People, people are booking them. And so I don't know if everyone is using some random, like, you know, service to get their appointments or what, but I, I never once saw Blaine available in the dozens of times I checked. But anyway, it so, only so, me... do you go to Canada a lot? Do people need to get this stuff or is it just silly? I, I would say that, um, no, like it's free for kids for Nexus, and we're just doing global entry for them, even right? Right, right. Box because yeah, because I, I got my global entry renewal uh, through all this stuff, and I Melinda did. I did. I'm not going to lie and say that I did something, but Melinda did something, and she applied online. And she answered the questions, and they said yes, we're going to renew you, blah blah blah, for ten years because of, or whatever, how long in five years or yeah, whatever. Years. Yeah. I didn't have to go in. I didn't have to do anything. They made an exemption and just punched mine through. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, at, at this point with, you know, if I had just had to drive to Boeing Field, which is like 15 minutes away, yeah, I'd right. continue to do Nexus, but I'm going to probably switch to just global entry because I don't, I don't drive across the Canadian border enough. I mean, I have friends that live up in Bellingham, which are within, you know, 20 minutes of the Canadian border and they all right. have it. But like when they go to Ikea, they drive into Canada to go to Ikea. They don't drive down to Seattle. So, got it. Um, you know, it makes sense for them. But yeah, this is total. <laughs> All right. So let's talk. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about today is uh, Europeans. They don't want cash anymore. What's the last time you guys went to Europe? March. So, five years. No, nah, it's not five years. We were there in Paris. When was that? Five years. Wow. It's been that nah. long? No, that was twenty. That was twenty. That was twenty fifteen, wasn't it? Hmm. I, I thought it was twenty sixteen, but that's okay. Um, that's wow, still that's, here. Is, is it really that long ago? Well, then you better get your ass on a plane now. So, um, I, I, we have Melinda and I. We have this uh, this little pouch uh, that we bring with us, where we have like change and and bills and whatnot for various countries in Europe. There's euros and then you've got some 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 funky countries like norway sweden and denmark and 
and uh, Bosnia and some other stuff that has uh, different currencies. And uh, this trip, I went to Sweden, I went to Norway, I went to the UK, I went to Denmark, I went to Italy. And um, it's the first, so they have replaced, you know, they have these machine where you have a credit card and you plug it in and sometimes they come to the table or they give you that and, and they've been really good at that. But for the first time, I only pulled out my actual credit card for one thing, and that was for paying for the tolls in the toll booth in Italy. Hmm. If you are paying, I, I used my iPhone to pay for absolutely everything. Absolutely oh, wow. everything I, I had to pay. Uh, the machines are now uh, at the table where 100% I paid, you know, restaurant checks all over every day for us and our customers uh, throughout the whole thing. And I literally used Apple Wallet. I used Apple Wallet for, for those who don't know what it is, Apple Wallet on your phone, you put in your credit cards and you have, you know, boarding passes and various things and other stuff down here at the bottom. But at the end of the day, it's more, you know, if we're looking at the thing, so you can see the various credit cards are in there and, uh, and I paid with that. And they were like, I tried to pay with cash to get rid of some of the stuff. Nobody wanted it. And it was funny. Rudy went, to the reception he had a, a big ass sack you know he looked like uh one of those guys who go to the bank and like they have those things you stuff the quarters in them right um he he had a big sack of quarter not quarters but local swedish currency and he brought it down to the reception at the sheraton and they say oh we don't we don't have any cash here because he wanted to change it into bills and he said what do you mean uh, well, can you, do you have it in the back? And I said, no, the hotel is cash free. We don't take cash. Wow. Anymore. wow. So the Sheridan in Stockholm, you want to wow. pay by cash? Sorry, mate. Ain't going to happen. And, uh, boy, is that, is it smart to have, uh, your wallet instead of having your, uh, your Apple wallet instead of having your, uh, your, because you don't, you're not handing your credit card number to anybody. Mm hmm. You literally are showing them your phone and nobody sees your credit card number. You know, when you hand something to a waiter, he brings it back. That, that's how, you know, credit card numbers get stolen. He brings yeah. it back in the back. He writes, writes down your stuff or he takes a picture on his phone. He has your uh, security number. He knows has the expiration date. He has everything. So, wow, I would say going to Europe now is is 100 uh, percent. And also the places we, we know that there are, I've had issues with that in Copenhagen. Uh, the trains, they don't take American credit cards. Oh, yeah. They, yeah. But they Real take pain. Apple Pay. Oh, they do. So Rudy, wow. Rudy plugged in his card, you know, wanted to do the old school thing here <laughs> yeah. and didn't get a ticket. I tapped with my Apple Pay. Boom. It went the through it went so but you just use one of your american credit cards through apple pay though right correct you just yeah. put your you put all your credit cards yes. in here you pick the yeah. one that you know so you have the capital one for everything then you have your sapphire reserve that goes for travel stuff you know hotels and 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 yeah. train tickets and all that everything travel related and then you have mm -hmm. yamex for your plane tickets which of course is not relevant here uh mm -hmm. but you know, I have those cards. I pick the one that's good and I tap it and that's the end of it. So I don't know if it will. So the only place that I can think of that had an issue was in Amsterdam where they don't take American credit cards. But I think that they've done that. That was the same exact thing as it was in, uh, in that they needed a pin code. But I guess when you tap, they've already, you know, verified that you have, you know, because you have to verify your you with your phone. Yeah. All right. And uh, and. You, you, you have to, you, you, you can't turn off the security on your phone. If you want to use Apple wallet, you have to have a face ID. If you don't have a face ID, no wallet for you. So, uh, or the, uh, the, if you have the, the, what is it called? The thumb, the, the iPhone, oh, yeah. uh, yeah. X, touch whatever, ID. Whatever it's called, the one that uh, okay. old people yeah. have because they don't Just have touch a, ID. Yeah. So, uh, that's the good way to, to, that's a fantastic, uh, improvement. I wonder when that's going to happen here. Yeah, I'm curious. I mean, how rural did you go? I'm going to be in like rural Scotland, like Shetland Islands uh, next month or later this month. Um, curious to know how I'll, I'll let you know how that goes. Well, I used so where did we go? I went to Stockholm. I went to London and Stockholm. I went to uh, northern Norway, where I'm from. You know, it's a twenty five thousand yeah. people town. 
yeah, uh, okay. the airport. Uh, I went to the grocery store. I went to to get flowers for my grandma. I went to get you know gifts. I went to you know my everywhere. It was okay. it was uh, and, and you know and also they've also started you know another pain in the ass that we've had is that when you rent cars outside the U.S. when we have uh, Hertz here you go to your car you sit out you drive right you just show the dude your driver's license you don't show anything guess what that has also become available now hmm. because of the COVID uh, they uh, didn't want to they don't want to touch you or they don't want to see you right so. I, we got to, it was funny because I was surprised because I, the first rent a car that we, uh, you know, there are other reasons why they shouldn't see the three of us, of course. I mean, if you're a girl, <laughs> you don't want to meet any of us, but uh, I digress. At the end of the day, though, I landed in, in Bergen. I looked at my phone and I saw that I'd gotten a message from Hertz where it says, this is your license plate number. This is your car. Just go to the garage. There is a person there waiting for you. And I went there. I showed her the license and off I went. Okay. So no signing, no waivers, no nothing. A phenomenal gig, and uh, and and that's a big. And the same thing happened when I got to Italy. Could you believe it? Italy mm -hmm. is like, uh, you know, they 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 changed the rules there because of the. Um, I mean, you had to go into the booth, right? There's a booth in Malpensa mm -hmm. when you walk around the corner on the right. You got to go in there. But I only showed my license. I didn't show my credit card. I didn't show my passport. Or anything like that. I just showed my oh. license, and that was it. So things have changed a lot in Europe since we were gone and to, for the positive. But mm -hmm. I mean, for it felt so safe and it's so organized. You don't have to worry about bringing your credit card. I mean, I did, that, it started at the end. I didn't even bring my wallet to dinner. I just had my phone. How awesome is that? That's cool. Yeah. I paid for dinner last night in Washington, D.C. with my phone. There you go. It, it, it took a global pandemic to get pay at the table to my uh, favorite little bar here, <laughs> but they got it now. So. That's cool. Yeah. Hey, what are we going to go back to that place that Rudy took us to? The place with the uh, with the pesto uh, pasta there. I can't remember the name of it, but I'm ready when you are. Come on oh by. Oh, my God. That, that was, was really amazing. good. <laughs> was and solid. for the price? Yeah. I mean, forget about it. There's not even a, a recession anymore. I'm like, I can't believe it. Yeah, no. So I think that that's uh, it, it. That's for the good of of of, of the pandemic. For what I wanted to, we we also were going to talk a little bit about pricing, what we are recommending for people, where to go, what to do. Um, looking at prices now in the fall, it looks like whoa, are is demand dropping like a stone? Uh, it looks like pricing is coming down across the board everywhere. Uh, you guys seen the same or? Uh, I'm poking around for uh, Europe this fall because it's a. Uh... It's the wife's uh, a milestone birthday. I won't name which one. Oh, it's her thirtieth birthday. I'll leave it at yeah. that. Yeah, it's her thirtieth birthday. Uh, yeah, it's uh, so uh, pricing is looking a, a lot more favorable than this summer. I'll just mm -hmm. leave it at that. I, I was I'm checking for Asia, well, particularly Taiwan uh, next February, and those still nothing there, like thirteen hundred dollars in coach. It's um, you know, right. not great. Uh, well, let's let's do a, a, a screen share here from uh, let's do a screen share here and uh, and see stops. Are we sharing a screen? I'm not sharing. Screen. Anything, yeah. I did them share. There we go. Uh, stop screen. And then we're going to share. And then we hit the button again. And then we do window, which is this one. So I just pulled up L.A. to Stockholm. Let's start there first. And this is an interesting market for, because um, SAS and Finnair, Finnair has started a base in Stockholm. They moved 350s to Stockholm and are flying to oh, the wow. U.S. from there, which is kind of insane. But uh, what does that mean? Well, that Love means it. that the round trip on, uh, so we're, we're looking at uh, L.A. to Stockholm here. Um, is uh, 8631 round trip. Uh, for September, I mean, it's a big gap there. This is, you know, what I need to what, what I need to travel. But if you look at the schedule, still, you can see yeah. that it's it is pretty decently uh, priced. Yeah. Uh, we're going for a week here in the end of September, beginning of October, and um, you know, if we look at premium economy, it's uh, you know about thousand bucks on lot. It's always there. B B A. They try to hand it with the big guys. Uh, Finnair uh, is not, you know, we, we probably took a Finnair day where Finnair didn't have availability for that. Maybe they don't have the nonstop going there for that day. But mm -hmm. you could easily find 
premium uh, sub thousands going to Stockholm. And the, the tip is here, if you're not going to Stockholm, let, let's see what, if we go from, we say from, uh, from New York city, um, it's more to fly because of the competition. It's more to fly. Well, this is premium economy. So thousand bucks on Air France. I kind of like that product. I like Air France premium economy. They got champagne and everything. Mm -hmm. So, and from, you know, up where you are, oh, you're neck of the woods, uh, Charlie. It's uh, not a favorable market to say the least, huh? No. Hmm. No. And what about Marshall? You are up at that airport in the middle of a field. Uh, out in West Virginia, West, oh, wow. West Virginia. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, West Virginia Dulles International Airport. About the same thousand bucks round trip as New York. Yeah. Hmm. Um, if we want to go to Italy, say we want to go to, you know, the whole situation to, to to Italy, it's kind of deteriorated a little bit because of all Italia used to dump the prices and Norwegian used to fly there. But I guess you can fly with TAP in economy and Turkish Airlines is kind of a. You know, if you got a lot, if you want to spend a lot of vacation going to Istanbul and back and wait and all that stuff, sure. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to go economy, then maybe not. Uh, it's like going to the dentist and having a root canal uh, lasting for fifteen hours each way. But um, uh, yeah, and business class, you know, Turkish is is still keeping the prices in the lower twos. Uh, but there is a trick, you know, that you can do if you want to travel in business class is. Uh, um, is to go from start originate in Europe. And I do that all the time and I'm back to doing that now. Um, and meaning that I buy a ticket out of Stockholm and this is business class pricing. See here, mm -hmm. um, business class on Finnair. I mean, they don't have, it doesn't look like they have on that particular down around. They, 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 it doesn't operate every day a week. So you got to try and see if you can. So the nonstop here, 1726, um, mm -hmm. Maybe they have, uh, oh, here it is the next day, right? So you will get round trip in business class from Europe, 1726, which is definitely still a decent price. Uh, but you can find, uh, I mean, what uh, Charlie, what are the good cities? We know about Dublin, right? Dublin is a good gig, yeah. Um, what's the other one? Um, I think some of the other Scandinavian countries can also be good. You can or at least pre-pandemic, you could find more out of like Oslo or Copenhagen at times. I'm flying back from Bergen. I don't remember. I didn't check business class from Bergen. Right. Um, no, it's not cheap. No, it's 2200. Uh, this yeah. is LA though. I mean, I'm sure Seattle is, is mighty. Uh, yeah, there you go. So, uh, <laughs> yep. I mean, yeah. Seattle doesn't have any competition. There's no. lot, not a lot of flights that go there. Yeah. LA has a ton. And with no. both, uh, you now you have North Atlantic coming, and then you already have SAS from Scandinavia that, that has a no. daily uh, from Copenhagen, and then you have Finnair from Stockholm, and then you've got uh, Norse from Oslo. That means you have three small markets with you know less you know 23, 24 million people that has no. three daily uh, big planes. You know one three fifty two three fifties and one seven eighty seven dash nine. Yeah. Uh, that's uh that's a, a, but it, i mean it's it's it pays to 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 look uh you know dublin has always been a winner and if you do fly here it's obviously we, we got you got to play around with it for a while but at the end of the day uh, uh going to uh you know the, the fares that you're seeing to chicago 485 wow. coach on Aer Lingus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 964 in Iberia. If you don't want to go that far, you go down to London. Uh, you've got the nonstop in American for 1200 bucks. I mean, the, the thing is that you, know, you, 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 if you go to Europe a lot, uh, like I do, I'm going four times this four times this year. And I have three out of those times. I spent 1500 to 1700 in business class. And one time I've, I've uh, paid for a uh, premium economy. Uh, which was about 700. I bought that during the pandemic. So it pays for me because I originate in Europe. So right now I started on Tuesday. I flew over to LA uh, on SAS with a stop in Copenhagen. I paid six, $1,580 round trip in business class. And then I'm going back to Europe in a few months. And that flight is also in business class paid for. You don't have to 
scurry around, around like worthless peasants and uh, wait for your upgrade and stand there hat mm-hmm. in hand like some dumpski or sit up all night <laughs> like this, along, along with all those tourists and everything like that. Uh, you get to have a nice sleep and uh, uh, a couple of buckets of that uh, champagne that they have. And uh, yeah, so I think that starting yeah. in Europe is not a bad idea. Is that what you, you did, Charlie, too? or? Yeah, I mean, what happened to me, for me is I had um, I had an outbound, but not a return. Right. And so I kind of just decided, like, you know, I just book an economy fair coming back. And then after looking at the prices of economy fares and and premium economy fares and then round trip premium economy fares, I just I ended up um, we're coming back in July from from Norway. And then we have an outbound back in December, the week before Christmas um, to Stockholm. And then. My return from Stockholm right now is um, you know, I managed to find four business class tickets on British Airways, so you know I had to pay a fee on top of that. But um, you know it worked out. But you know where the, where I think these fares also make a lot of sense is people are always talking about positioning flights and things like that to get their business class. But if you're paying sixty thousand miles one way to Europe, plus your positioning for one hundred and fifty or two hundred bucks, like. You know, you're all in. I mean, in my mind, actual cash price now like a thousand dollars or more one way. Um, and if it go, if it's more than that, then you know it starts to make sense to just buy a premium economy ticket, especially on. I mean, a real premium economy, not like Delta, extra leg room or whatever. You know, those sorts of things. But if you can get real premium economy round trip, um, you know, for like, you know, we're looking at 1200 bucks, um, which I think is what I'm paying to get back from Bergen and then to Seattle and then back to Norway, uh, back to Stockholm. I think I'm paying 1200, 1250 bucks. Um, that's better than, you know, British Airways is 60,000 Alaska miles plus 200 bucks a person one way in business. So I'm already right. up. To, yeah. You know, yeah. Back. It's important to, to do the numbers. And also you kind of get tricked into that thing. If you, Uh, a typical thing that I did, like before the pandemic, it was a thousand dollars to fly round trip on British Airways from, from Scandinavia or from Dublin, Amsterdam, Brussels, those, it varied which one was the cheapest one to go from. Then you have, you found the availability in Avios one way to upgrade from premium economy to business. And it's like 20,000 points, not, not a lot. Uh, And then you have to pay the taxes difference and all that stuff. It's if it originates from, from Heathrow. So it's a few hundred bucks there. And then you are at LAX and you had a long week and you're looking and there's been no availability on, on, uh, there's no availability on, uh, on, on upgrading with Avios and you get to LAX and it's like, they have an offer 700 bucks for business class. And guess what? Round trip buying round trip in business is usually you can find deals from Europe from 17 to 200, 200, uh, uh, to to seventeen hundred to two thousand dollars easy fifteen hundred to two thousand. You have Tap Air Portugal. You have uh, the competition situation with now with uh, with Norris coming in and again and Play coming in from Iceland. And then voila, guess what? If you buy at a premium economy fare and you spend the miles and the money to upgrade one way and you pay seven hundred dollars to upgrade the other, you spend three thousand dollars like some dumpski. And all of that stuff, sitting there looking and having these alerts on expert fly, who will it be available? And then you call and you have to call BA to get that stuff. You, they don't have it online. So you wait for about 37 hours to get through on the phone with that. And then you call through and it's like, oh, sorry, my T, it's already gone. You know, and then, you know, instead of doing that, you just pay it up and be like right now i couldn't be happier i spent an average of uh, of 811 dollars each way in business class paid for for the three, three trips that i had and yeah. i could not be happier with than that yeah but yeah, it's a good trip. Yeah. work in europe play around with google flights i think is is the uh, you'd be surprised at what you can find and i think that you know dublin is a good city to start in Barcelona used to be good and Rome used to be good, but Norwegian are gone. So those are not that uh, pop anymore. Uh, but uh, the Stockholm is a hot number. Helsinki is a hot number. Dublin is a hot number. Inverness is sometimes a hot number. Budapest. If you originate from there and you fly, say, $50, yeah, I mean, you will always find something. You don't have to spend a couple hundred bucks to position in Europe. 
Uh, no. It's, uh, no. it's usually it's as long as you stay away from Amsterdam, Frankfurt, and Paris, Charles de Gaulle, and London Heathrow, you will find stuff that's much much less expensive. And you know, if you don't want to spend, I mean, think about it. A premium economy, five hundred dollars a person, or each way, five hundred dollars each way. That's not a bad pre price at all. No. Not at all. For what you get. I mean, I'm paying to go nonstop from here to Chicago uh, to the loyalty summit on Tuesday. I'm paying, you know, freaking four hundred and fifteen dollars on United for for sitting in coach and upgrade. That's uh, they want for that upgrade. They wanted like nine hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, like my that. my positioning flight to New York is was four hundred and nine dollars this summer yeah, to get my crazy. my business class, you know, to London. I was like, I'm I'm kind of regretting that, but it is what it is. So, hey, at least you didn't bring your whole family with you on that one. Oh wait, I am. Hi. Oh, oh, I, I, it's on Alaska, so I used I burned my two. Uh, companion ticket thing so it was only you know a thousand dollars total oh i was gonna ask you about the uh i was gonna ask you about the upgrade i got a trip from san diego to Kauai. that uh first class is empty how do i upgrade that do, do you have upgrade certificates or no i do not i don't have status with alaska only yeah America. so you got to look for you can try and see if there's u class available on expert flyer or you can go try and book the same flight on alaskaair.com and select the gold guest upgrade. And if it shows, it'll, it'll show you uh, before, you know, just in the list of flights, a blue U. And if, if that's there, then, um, then you can upgrade. The problem is Alaska used to give you four upgrades at gold and then four more upgrades at 75 K and they've since said oh no the rule was always that we just gave four at gold but we were generous and gave four more at 75k and we're not doing that anymore so now hmm. as a 75k you have like four upgrade certificates each year and it's like well yeah thanks that's <laughs> they're hard enough hey, at least you got a new level you got a 100k level there and there's my kitty say say hi Look sonny Hi. Sorry. Sorry, we had we we had to go off camera for a cat escape. Oh, That's no. cool. <laughs> That's my baby. Covered. Okay. Well, thank you guys for joining me, chatting for the last hour. And uh, this is the Miles and Points Report. Uh, we are back, and we are going to do every other Thursday for an hour, uh, starting today. So a couple of weeks from now. Uh, I encourage everybody to uh, register for the Frequent Travel University this weekend. We're having a seminar on Saturday. Go to ftuniversity.com if you are an annual member. It is, as always, complimentary to uh, register. I hope to see you there. And do you guys have any travel going in for the next few weeks? I got none for me. I leave, I leave uh, for Europe uh, in two weeks, just over like two weeks from tomorrow. Or cool. Saturday, so. Well, enjoy the Scandic Torge in uh, in Bergen. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I'll see you guys uh, when you come back. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, next, week, oh, two, uh, right. next week we're yeah. doing a Rudy show on Thursday, so we'll see everybody then for that. If not, it's a couple of weeks now until the Miles and Points reporting back. Thanks for dialing in, yeah. and we'll see you guys next time. Ciao.